Bernie Sanders is not the only socialist elected to office in the United States. This week on the show, Seattle's socialist city councilwoman, Shama Sawant, plus alternative energy expert, Yanis Magouris, on going from theory to practice in left government in Greece. All that and a few words from me on Liberal Democrats, Rosa Luxemburg, and Lemonade. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. It's taken a lot of commentators by surprise. Even after he'd been mathematically counted out of the Democratic nomination race, support for Bernie Sanders just kept coming in. As of the end of May, he'd received 7.6 million contributions, won 22 contests, attracted 2.4 million donors, and 41% of those were 18 to 39 years old. Surprising, said the money media, because Sanders is a gray-haired socialist in the United States of America. One person who wasn't surprised, though, is our next guest. Shama Sawant is a teacher, activist, organizer, and a member of Socialist Alternative. She was a visible presence on the Occupy scene and an activist in her union, the American Federation of Teachers, Local 178. In 2013, she ran for Seattle City Council on a platform of fighting for a $15 an hour minimum wage, rent control, and taxing the super rich to fund mass transit and education. She defeated a 16-year incumbent Democrat to become the first socialist elected in a major U.S. city in decades, and the first socialist on the Seattle City Council since 1877. Shama, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I have so many things I want to talk to you about, and I've wanted to talk to you for so long. But let's start with Bernie Sanders. You weren't surprised, right? No, in fact, when we won our election campaign, first election campaign in 2013, it took the establishment by surprise. And certainly, I won't make it sound like it was a walk in the park. It was a real struggle. We ran, as you know, as an open socialist, as a socialist alternative candidate, in defiance of the Democratic Party establishment that controls the city of Seattle. There is no Republican establishment in Seattle to speak of. And so our battle was against the Democratic Party. And we were not surprised by the fact that we won because we, the fact that we ran was to, you know, the reason we ran was to demonstrate that there is an mm. opening for independent left politics. And we also showed that the word socialism is not a barrier. Socialist is not a bad label to have. And Bernie has shown that that is true all across America. He has found a huge echo in the heartland yeah. of America. And this is the seat of global capitalism. Well, how do you define socialism? I mean, what are they looking for if not just the name? Right. I think the label is a secondary. What's, what's the concept? What's the vision of society people are looking for? I would say I'm fighting for a society which, global society, which delivers a high standard of living to all human beings in an environmentally sustainable manner. I believe that this can be done given the technological advances and the food production and productivity in general that we have achieved as human society today. But it can't happen on the basis of capitalism because the wealth, the, the vast amount of wealth that generated under capitalism is in the hands of a very few elite at the top who have no incentive to organize that wealth in the service of human needs. And so I would say we need to move away from capitalism. And I would, I would define that vision of society as socialism. And I would say the large majority of human beings would subscribe to that Is idea. it as simple as, as having government that puts society at the center as opposed to government that puts capital at the center? Well, I think that uh, you know this idea that uh, maybe we can have a little bit of attention to capital and then mostly to other needs does not work. I mean, it, there's no, there's no paradigm where capitalism and socialism can coexist, meaning in order to achieve the goals that you would consider as socialist goals, meaning ending poverty, ending malnutrition, having real high quality mass transit, moving away from fossil fuels, all of that, or none of that actually, is going to be possible on the basis of capitalism. So in order to achieve socialism, we'll have to really 
challenge the existence of, existence of capitalism itself. But haven't we have seen countries like the Scandinavian countries move in that direction without declaring themselves social? Well, Scandinavian countries definitely have achieved a lot more than what we have seen in the United States. They've, they've, they've had a much bigger expanse of public education, public health care, as you said. And in fact, the reason they won that was because of courageous labor movements, just like in the US, but they went farther. I mean, they were able to get bigger gains. But I would call the Scandinavian countries social democracies mm -hmm. under the system of capitalism, which would mean basically that it would, you know, in today, if we had social democratic ideas in the United States, which I think a lot of people are expressing support for through Bernie Sanders' campaign, it would be a huge progress. But if you look at what's happened to Scandinavia right now, many of those gains that were hard fought yeah. for are being lost in this wave of austerity. So as long as the power and the wealth remains in the hands of the capitalist class, we will never be able to maintain our mm. reforms, let alone winning bigger ones. So that brings us to Bernie Sanders. I mean, how does his actual agenda stack up against what you're describing as the sort of socialist goal? He calls himself a socialist, but he's running in the Democratic Party. Yes, primary. I mean, in reality, if we looked at what, what he defines himself as, I would say that is social democratic principles and I would, as a socialist, go farther than that. But I think what's happened because of Sanders' campaign, and here is where I would say he has indeed performed a huge service for uh, American working class people, is that he was able to run as a socialist. He never disowned that label. Every time the media tried to mm -hmm. needle him, he owned it, he embraced it, and that's important because it gave people, regardless of what he means by socialism, it gave people the courage to own that label for themselves. And we are in a new generation where there is no vilification of socialism in their minds mm. because they're not part of the Cold War era. They're looking for an alternative to capitalism. So one one last thing, you talked about capitalism can't coexist with socialism, but it also can't coexist really with imperialism. Um, what about Bernie Sanders' foreign policy agenda? Not so different from Hillary's real. Well, you're right. I mean, socialism cannot coexist with imperialism. And I would say imperialism, especially in the modern decades, has been used as a tool to further the forces of global capitalism. There is no question about that. And I, we have, myself and Socialist Alternative, we've always been open about our differences with Sanders. We don't agree with his position uh, on uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. In fact, I think he has tied his hands in many ways by not being bold on that stand. Although but he's I been think, bolder than just about everybody else. Yes, yes. That's absolutely <laughs> important to recognize, Laura. I really appreciate that. And in fact, if you compare Hillary Clinton to, to Bernie Sanders, it's not like they're two sides of the same coin, but they're just slightly different. It's not like that. So Hillary Clinton is a foreign policy hog. Bernie Sanders voted against the Iraq war. He voted against the Patriot Act. And he has been true to many of the ideals of the working class. And really, if we are, if we are to fight imperialism, then we need mm. a movement for towards socialism. Well, and that's exactly what you've called for. You, so you actually petitioned, the Socialist Alternative petitioned him to run outside of the context right. of the Democratic Party. Right. What's happened to that? Well, before he launched his campaign, actually, I was personally and Socialist Alternative, we, we were collectively asking him to run as an independent. He did not. And I think the, what's happened so far has proven that despite the echo that he got, the Democratic Party establishment is absolutely determined to push him aside and install Hillary as their nominee. So we have launched this petition through Movement for Bernie.org, where we are urging people to urge Bernie. Mm. If you sign the petition, I urge you to sign it, uh, we are to urge Bernie to run as an independent if he does not get the Democratic Party nomination. And what else might need to happen? I mean, it's, we can't put, you can't put all of your hopes on, on him. No, no, it, this is not about Bernie. You're exactly right, Laura. So actually, what we need is a real conversation among activists. We need a real conference, nationwide conference, to discuss the question of an independent party for the 99% it is high time we had a party of our own. Wall Street has two of them. <laughs> so if we had such a party, we would need to figure out what to actually do. Um, I would probably vote for it, for sure. But I would be under no illusions that it would be incredibly difficult to govern in a different way. You're getting experience in Seattle, and I'm curious how you square the work that you're doing at the local level with this grand national vision of a real departure from capitalism. I'm assuming it doesn't feel like you're departing from capitalism in Seattle? Well, it's true that when we fought for 15, for example, and we won that historic victory, $15 an hour is a, a big step forward for those who are, those who are the workers who have been mired in poverty in Seattle. But of course, you know, if, if you're fighting for a socialist agenda, it goes well, well beyond. Right. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. 
But I think the, the interesting phenomenon of building movements for socialism and challenging, fundamentally challenging capitalism is that people get empowered through the fight for reforms themselves because the fight, the process of fighting itself, it shows you, first of all, what you're up against. Mm -hmm. You know, big business will fight tooth and nail against you, even against the most minor of reforms. And the reason they will do that, it's rational on their part to do that because they know that if you, as working class movements, get empowered by winning $15 an hour, you're going to want to mm. go forward and say, hey, we want gender, we want to end the gender pay gap. We want to fight against police brutality. We want single payer health care. But that's exactly the lesson we want uh, our mm -hmm. movements to learn, that being empowered by the experience of victories and by the experience of fighting against big business, developing the method of struggle itself is part of being a socialist. And that's a very important process. So I would say fighting for reforms and having a truly revolutionary agenda to move away from capitalism, they are interlinked and they're absolutely necessary. And it was some of the anti-police brutality folks, the Black Lives Matter folks, who actually confronted Bernie Sanders in Seattle early on, right? BLM activists did confront Bernie Sanders. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the uh, speakers who, you know, black uh, or organizers and activists who are supporting Bernie Sanders, like Michelle Alexander, like Sean King, like uh, Killer Jealous. Mike. Yes, exactly. Ben Jealous, everyone. Nina Turner from Ohio. I think what they are saying is that the advancement of uh, the black liberation movement, the fact that black, black people have been in the eye of the storm, in this real, uh, this sort of backslide of living standards, they, and Michelle Alexander specifically, have correctly characterized this as a social control mechanism that is necessary for an overall exploitative mm. system, that is capitalism. So there is no way we can fight for black rights without building mm. larger movements along with them for working class rights and vice versa. You know, one of the things that is driving a lot of people to embrace Hillary Clinton, after all, is fear of Donald Trump. In specific fear of his kind of white supremacist, anti-immigration, both rhetoric and, and language and what he's doing on his side to stir up his supporters. Oh, it's absolutely rational so, on our parts to be terrified of Trump's agenda. So, so I mean, how do you respond to people who say, well, for that right. reason, we shouldn't abandon the Democratic Party right now? Right, right. I, I mean, I, that's a very important question to be thinking about. And I think millions of people are gr trying to grapple with that. First of all, it's absolutely horrifying. You know, it's stomach turning what Trump is, you know, what Trump stands for. The unfortunate part is that the vast majority of people who are supporting Trump are not just absolutely rabid racists. I mean, there is a current of racism that is unfortunately being elevated because of his because of his campaign's ascendancy. But in reality, the vast majority of support that Trump gets is among alienated people. You know, people who are alienated from because of corporate politics. They're angry at the corporate bailouts that happened and working people were left behind and completely abandoned. And it's that anger against the corporate establishment that is driving support for him. So here's my question. I think that it would be circular logic to argue that if Trump is really ascending because of the anger against the corporate establishment, then how can we fight Trump by putting forward an alternative who is the epitome of the very establishment that is pushing people towards mm -hmm. Trump. So, and Trump himself is not something that happened overnight. The Trump phenomenon is a result of a decades-long rightward shift by both the Republican and the Democratic parties. And that is why the only way we can really fight Trump and also fight building, you know, fight against any kind of building of an ongoing basis for the right wing is to build a left wing alternative to the corporate establishment. Mm -hmm. And that is why, I, because of those reasons, you know, supporting Hillary Clinton is fundamentally antagonistic to really fighting against the right. And I would say this, you know, for those who feel that, okay, this year, let's not break from the Democratic Party. I agree with everything you say, but let's, let's not do it this year. Here's my question. If defeating Trump was the priority for the Democratic Party establishment, why, is, why haven't they done everything in their power to put forward as their nominee the, the one candidate who, through polls, has been shown uh, to be able to deliver a thumping defeat to Trump, which is Sanders. Every poll shows that Sanders can you know, decisively defeat Trump. In fact, a new poll came that shows that Trump is leading Clinton by five point percentage points. And in fact, he is going to disingenuously and despicably run as if he's to the left of Clinton. And really, what we're seeing is the least popular presidential candidate, which is Trump, running against the second least popular candidate presidential mm. candidate in history, which is Hillary Clinton. What you're suggesting is there is a way to go from here to build something better. Uh, I guess I'm scared that there's 
likely to be a huge disappointment for the people that have come into this race on the Bernie Sanders side, uh, because at the end of the day, they'll be shuttled into the same old politics. You're absolutely right. I mean, I feel the same fear that unless we provide a different avenue for the political energy, especially of the younger generation, there will be a wave of demoralization. If Bernie Sanders simply turns around and says, you know, you all supported me because you hate the corporate establishment, now I'm going to tell you to support that very corporate establishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't make sense for him that? to uh, have endorsed Hillary in a few months' time. But so far, all indications are that he may not go the movement for Bernie path. You know, we are, we are urging through movement for Bernie that he should run as an independent. And I'll say this, I mean, I don't know that this is going to happen. I don't think it's likely, but you never know. Events are shifting. But I would say this, if Sanders was, was to run as, uh, you know, as a presidential candidate with Stein on the Green Party ticket with Jill Stein, Jill Stein. who has launched her independent campaign with an excellent program, I might say, you know, it's, it's, her program is more to the left than Bernie Sanders' program. And if we had a Sa Sanders-Stein presidency run, it would be enormous. It would be no less than a political earthquake. But at the same time, I will also say this. I will thank Bernie for all the service he has, you know, has provided in, in terms of really activating a whole tens of millions of young people. I will also not want to sacrifice our movement to his decision if he were to decide to endorse Hillary right. Clinton. We should not, we should be standing with Sanders as long as he can go and really demanding that he run as an independent. But at the same time, we should not hold our movement hostage to any one person's decision. Our movement has to keep going forward. So I would say that if Sanders does not run as an independent, does not run with Stein, then we absolutely, our movement should stand behind Stein and you know, really support her candidacy. But not, and, and again, it's not just about her either. It's about using Jill Stein's campaign, using her platform in order to raise the question of independent politics. And that would be a good vehicle if Sanders does not run. Um, if you were, I don't know, mayor tomorrow, or if you had charge of a city like Seattle, what would be your socialist agenda? What would you actually try to do or get done at the, at the local level? What would it look like? Well, first like? of all, just to give a, the political context be, behind which we won uh, as a city council member and won the re-election, and if we were to win other seats and if we were to run other candidates, it's definitely not about me. It's not about Bernie, it's not about me. It's about that mass movement that we're building, and we would like to run independent candidates and build an independent party in service of these mass movements to win social change. It's not about the candidates. But if we were to win such a platform, it would, if we were to have won that platform, it would have indicated already an ascendancy of the movement. I mean, the fact that we won mm -hmm. was not in a political right. vacuum. It won because there was a movement, you know, Occupy movement, the Wisconsin public sector uprising. Things were changing all across the world, starting with the Arab Spring. And so I would say that if that happened, we would have a groundswell of momentum for all kinds of things. We would want to tax the rich to fund public schools. We, want to tax, we would want to tax corporations to make full funding available for a full-fledged metropolitan mass transit system in Seattle, which we've been fighting for. But who's the obstacle to that? The Democratic Party establishment. So the first number one step is to build our independent movements and build an independent party for the 99%. All right. Thank you so much, Samash Wan. So glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. So how easy is it to go from theory to practice in government? Not so long ago, I had a chance to talk to alternative energy expert Yanis Margouris, who ended up in charge of the energy sector in the Syriza government in Greece. When describing the Greek crisis, even before getting elected uh, in, in January 2015, we've been trying to emphasize that this is a dual crisis. The European Union has not hasn't found a way of getting out of the crisis in a social and democratic and just way. There are millions of unemployed people in Europe. Um, wages are getting low, pensions are getting low, investments are not really rolling. Uh, and the future doesn't seem very, very uh, clear and open for European citizens in general. So Syriza found itself a bit lonely in a set of European balance, which is on the other side of the political spectrum, right, some extreme right. Um, so it, it proved that the European Union and its institutions were not that democratically sensitive as many of the analyses 
was arguing. What we discovered was the potential, the huge potential of the public company to be used as a center for development, not only for the company revenues or the employees, but also for the general public. So that's why where we're giving most of our efforts to find ways of working with the employees in the company that were not used to such a process and to find other actors in the Greek economy and society and develop common projects to expand technological know-how, to expand knowledge within the market and the society regarding, for example, electricity grid and be able to, s to create an ecosystem of universities, research centers, individual researchers. You need to build new institutions of planning. And since it's a left administration, institutions which are also open to public and social influence and public and social participation. Uh, and, and in order for these processes to be successful, as history has proven, you need to have, let's say, a period of stability. And the crisis does not give you that. So the economic crisis creates circles of political crisis, administrations change, um, and people feel demotivated and powerless. And then during the last year, and I th I'm really afraid that this probably might be the, the big factor that will determine this historic period, is the refugee crisis. It sometimes it feels like you, you get 50 years old older within one year. Uh, you can feel the exhaustion. And so you really need to try not to lose the greater vision, the greater joy of being among people and caring about people and you know, getting, being loved and love social processes. I mean, one thing that the, the, the Greek experience uh, <coughs> has proved is that we, we need to move further from just, you know, slogans or demands. Uh, there's no one out there ready to uh, give us what we think we deserve. Uh, we need to build it, get it, uh, design it, implement it. Our generation in Europe um, is not given another choice. As some of you may remember, I've been hosting an ongoing series with economist Rick Wolf and journalist Chris Hedges looking at the left's classic texts in the contemporary context. Well, the text this year was Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution. Now, I know that prodding people to pick up old texts has its challenges. Luxembourg didn't tweet or Snapchat or podcast. She wrote in German, most famously in response to a series of articles with titles like this one, Die Voraussetzungen des Sozialismus und die Aufgaben der Sozialdemokratie, the 1899 edition. But don't let that put you off. Luxembourg was a phenomenon. A woman, a Jew, an immigrant, a person living with a disability, very young, in her 20s when she wrote her most important work. She faced prejudices galore and still rose to become one of the outstanding revolutionary figures of the pre-World War I generation. In the 1890s, she led the fight against the evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary socialists who argued that capitalism might not need to collapse or the proletariat revolt, but rather could be reformed gradually. To set the scene, imagine if you can living in a time at the turn of a new century in which new technologies are everywhere on the rise, but everywhere corporate cartels or monopolies control not just the economic but the political mechanisms of the state. Now imagine that wages are falling, trade unions are struggling, and wars of empire seem always to be breaking out. Crazy, right? Imagine further that a man is arguing that socialism can be advanced not by overturning that state, but by electing a self-described socialist president. He's even talking about a revolution. What is going on? Now, I don't know where your mind could possibly have wandered off to, but that situation is more or less the one that Rosa Luxemburg found herself in in the 1890s. No nibbling reformer she. Luxembourg accused the evolutionists of, quote, proposing to change the sea of capitalist bitterness into a sea of socialist sweetness by progressively pouring into it bottles of social reformist lemonade. 
reform or revolution? Still think it's an outmoded text? Take another look. And then, how about sending some support to the media that even tolerates and even encourages thinking about this sort of stuff? Not in German, but in English.